In this week's news, Starship Booster 7 rolls out to the launch pad, SLS has been testing and NASA still wants to share seats with Russia. This is tomorrow's Space News. It's out with the old and in with the new at Starbase as Raptor 1 vehicles are being retired and the next generation is starting to come online. The start of this process was the arrival of these three new Raptor 2 engines which are massively trimmed down from their Raptor 1 counterparts. The next day, everybody was up bright and early for the rolling out of Booster 7, the first super heavy booster to be compatible with Raptor 2 engines. It currently doesn't have any engines, or any grid fins for that matter, but it is compatible with them, which Booster 4 isn't. Following a very pretty sunrise over the Gulf of Mexico, the load spreader attachment for the crane was hooked up to Booster 7, and the next day, it was lifted up by the SpaceX LR11000 crane and placed onto the orbital launch mount. I will be honest, after seeing Booster 4 lifted and moved so many times, seeing a booster without engines is a very strange size. It kind of feels a bit bare, especially with the plumbing for the engines just dangling under the thrust puck. Once lifted onto the orbital launch mount and the team had verified that it was safe to do so, SpaceX started the booster's first cryogenic proof test. As you can see by the frost forming on the booster, all of the tanks were filled up with the entirety of the top tank, the methane tank, and the bottom tank, the oxygen tank, turning white. Booster 8's second aft tank section has been rolled into the high bay. Following on from the other section we saw being rolled in during the rollout, roll in, rollout, roll in shenanigans of Booster 7 last week. Booster 8's common dome has also been lifted onto the second aft section, producing the beginnings of the liquid oxygen tank. The wide bay is nearing completion with the final beams at the top of the building being lifted into place over the past week, as well as the start of a very important addition. The bridge crane girders have started to be lifted into place, which is very important for a rocket factory as you need to be able to lift your rocket parts. When the high bay was first constructed, SpaceX didn't have a specialised crane in the building so they had to use a normal crane that reached in through the roof. A total of five girders have been seen being lifted in so far. And finally this week at Starbase, two of the new design domes have been delivered to the production site at Starbase. The government of the Philippines has announced that they will be the first country in Southeast Asia to have access to the Starlink network. According to Trade Secretary Ramon Lopez, Starlink will complement the Philippines' current infrastructure, allowing an increase in the average internet speed across the country. Starlink is aiming to deploy three gateways in the country in the initial phase of the rollout to target the areas where internet connectivity has been difficult or just impossible. SpaceX are also currently setting up a Filipino subsidiary similar to the subsidiary they own in India. Originally scheduled for April 3rd, the wet dress rehearsal for the space launch system was pushed back by a day due to pressurisation issues in the mobile launch platform. Due to the fact that the countdown net is not available to the public, all our updates are coming via the NASA Exploration Ground Systems Twitter account, which initially announced at 1508 UTC on April 3rd that there was an issue with the primary and the redundancy supply fans for the mobile launcher pressurisation. This was followed by another tweet just under two hours later, which confirmed that the dress rehearsal was scrubbed for that day and that a second attempt would commence approximately 24 hours later. Sadly however, that attempt was also halted by a glitch. The team was unable to open a necessary vent valve on the mobile launcher just before the loading of hydrogen was about to commence. That meant that the next attempt was moved to the release date of this video, April 5th, and at the time of writing, that's the latest we've heard. These delays may seem annoying now, but it's very normal and very expected. Catching all the hiccups now means that come launch day in the summer, the countdown can be as flawless as possible. The three lightning protection towers also got to show off their skills on the 2nd of April as the strongest lightning strike that the NASA Grand Systems team has ever seen on this equipment hit. From the footage, it looks like the strike was on the service tower on the mobile launcher, however the strike was actually on one of the catenary wires behind the tower. The Artemis Accords has also just received its 18th member and a third from Asia, which is Singapore, following Japan and South Korea. This move is more of a diplomatic move as there have been no hardware agreements announced, however it is very exciting to see so many different nations signing onto the agreement to ensure that the future of space exploration is peaceful and for the better of humanity. NASA is still interested in the deal with Russia, which would see Russian cosmonauts flying on commercial vehicles and American astronauts flying on Soyuz. Anna Kikina is currently scheduled to fly on Crew Dragon as Mission Specialist 2 on Crew 5, and Frank Rubio is currently rumoured to be flying on MS-22. However, Kathy Luders, the Associate Administrator for Space Operations at NASA, has said that the paperwork still needs to be completed by Russia quickly. If not, they won't have enough time to train Kikina to fly on Dragon, and the spacesuits may not be able to be built in the time frame available. 
as everything about a spacesuit is custom fit to every single astronaut. Agreements like this are important as it is in the interest of both the United States and Russia to have at least one person on the International Space Station from their respective nations in the event that either Soyuz in Russia's case or the commercial vehicles in the US's case would not be able to operate. Even though what Russia is doing in Ukraine is horrific and completely unjustified, space is the one place where there are no borders and especially on the ISS. Everyone needs to work together to keep the orbiting laboratory orbiting. The White House has requested NASA's fiscal year 2023 budget with them seeking approximately $26 billion for next year. That's an increase of $1.9 billion from the enacted budget for fiscal year 2022 with proposed increases across the board apart from four specific categories, two of which are science related and the other two which are exploration related. The Space Launch System and Orion are losing $20 million and $68 million respectively, although that can come down to the fact that both are expected to have flown at least once when the final version of this proposal is enacted. With no more need to develop Orion and Block 1 of SLS, the development fund significantly reduced and instead NASA will be focusing on the operations of the rocket and the improvements for Block 1B. This also came with a $159 million increase for Exploration Ground Systems which covers the Ground Service Equipment or GSE. Both astrophysics and heliophysics have also lost funding with a decrease of 12.9 million for the former and 17.7 .7 million for the latter. The biggest increase in funding is for space technology which has a 30.7% increase over the 2022 budget up to 1.4 billion. That contains 30 million dollars which will go towards orbital debris research such as the Chinese booster which crashed into the moon. Europa Clipper's cost overrun has also been confirmed with 703 million dollars being added to the cost of that mission. Europa Clipper will be launching in 2024, but we've had a few launches over the past week, so let's take a look in space traffic. Firstly, let's head up to low Earth orbit where the Tianzhou 2 cargo resupply mission undocked from the Tiana Core Module Forward port of the Tiangong 3 space station at 0759 UTC on the 27th of March. Its orbit decayed over the next four days before the end of the mission was declared at 1040 Coordinated Universal Time on March 31st. If you're asking why I didn't cover this in last week's episode, it's because I didn't know it had happened happened. March 30th at 0229 UTC saw a long March 11 launch with Tiang Ping 2, A, B and C inside the payload fairing from the Zhiquan Satellite Launch Center in China. According to the China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation or SASC, the mission was a success. Just a few hours later, at 0721 UTC, Soyuz MS-19 departed the Nadir docking port on the RASFET module and headed back to Earth. Landing back on Earth, 147 kilometers southeast of the city of Shezkazgan in Kazakhstan at 11.28 the same day, the end of the mission marked the stopping of the stopwatch on Mark van der Heij's record-breaking spaceflight duration, spending 355 days in space, breaking Scott Kelly's 340-day record to become the American with the longest single spaceflight. Commander Anton Shkaplerov was the first to emerge from the capsule, being followed by fellow Russian Pyotr Dubrov, who also spent 355 days in space, but they didn't break the 437-day Russian record, which is currently held by Valery Polyakov. If you saw the April Fool's News show, you'll know that on April 1st at 1624 UTC, Transporter 4 lifted off from Slick 40 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. It didn't actually get stuck in the dome of the flat Earth, instead it successfully deployed all of the rideshare payloads with with B-1061 landing for the seventh time on the drone ship just read the instructions approximately 532 kilometers downrange. Supporting JRTI was support ship Bob which recovered the brand new fairings seen here returning to Port Canaveral. B-1061 has also returned to Port Canaveral. The final launch to cover is Rocket Lab's second of the year and the silver launch of the Electron rocket. Commencing at 12.41 UTC on April 2nd or nearly 2 o'clock in the morning local time on April 3rd at Launch Complex 1A on the Mejia Peninsula, on board were two Black Sky satellites with a combined mass of 120 kilos. Coming up this week we have SJ6 Group 6 on a Long March 4B, Lotus S1 on a Soyuz and AX1 on a Falcon 9. This girl's a fascination And nothing in her way will keep her from her destination Cause she's fine if you think that this content is worth contributing financially for, then consider joining the wonderful people on your screen now. The Escape Velocity, Orbital, Suborbital and Ground Support citizens all receive various perks such as seeing space news scripts as they're being written and access to the pre and post show tomorrow live broadcasts. If those perks sound like something you're interested in, head to youtube.com forward slash tmro forward slash join or just hit the join button below.
If you're new around here and you want to join the club, then hitting that subscribe button, making sure it's no longer red and hitting like on all our videos does a lot in the eyes of the almighty YouTube algorithm. If you haven't heard yet, I'm running a GoFundMe campaign to try and raise the funds to fly out to Cape Canaveral in August to report on the launch of Psyche, the first mission to the only known metal asteroid in the solar system. At the time of writing, nearly half the funds have already been raised, so if you want to help out with that, the link is at the top line of the description. For now though, thank you very much for watching. And goodbye.